It is the wisdom, it is the insight. He is the president of International Cyber Threat Task Force and he's going to deliver a presentation addressing how EU cyber strategy is making physical and digital entities more resilient. Please welcome Paul C. Dwyer. Thank you, Jess. Cheers. Good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome. Um, and we've had a few resilience issues here this morning already, so uh, we're dealing with those, but it's all going to be fine, I believe. So uh, it's not just the beard. There's a little bit too. Uh, the background as well of over 30 years' experience in the world of cybersecurity, working around the world with law enforcement, military, and, of course, global corporations as well, and protecting them. If you want to know more, there's the websites. But we kick on because I have a very short period of time to fit in a lot of information that I want to talk about. And... The first thing is the elephant in the room, guys, and the elephant in the room is really talking about cyber threats themselves. For many people, there is an instinct, there is just that uh, predefined thing where they want to silo them, and they want to go, oh yeah, it's about cyber crime, oh, it's cyber warfare, uh, it's people stealing credit card data, it's people's phishing emails, and they try and silo it. The reality is, it's like a group of blind people walking into a room and looking at an elephant, and depending on what angle you come at, it's something different, but it's all the same thing. It's an elephant. So when a group of blind people here and they come to the back of the elephant, they think they're looking at a rope. At the front, they might think it's a snake or a spear. All road leads to cyber threats, or as I refer to it, cyber evil, because there's lots of different motivations behind cyber threats and cyber threat actors, bad actors, whatever you want to call them. Lots of different kinds of motivations. For criminals, it's money. For, for hacktivists, it may be ideology. For warfare point of view, it may be the fact that somebody wants to get an economic advantage over another country, whatever it happens to be. But they all lead back to one thing that we refer to as cyber threats. So guys, this is about headlines, and we can choose our headline. So here's a headline that's been kind of, you know, this is obviously a fictitious headline, but could it be realistic? The internet is down, the connection to Ireland. We've seen lots of stuff within the media about um, the Atlantic cables and so on possibly being attacked and Russian cyber threat activity and so on in this space. So is that the headline we're going to have, that Ireland has become cyber collateral damage due to Russian threat activity? Or are we going to have something like Ireland's cybersecurity levels are attracting foreign direct investment, and even the Estonians are coming over here to learn how to do cyber? Wouldn't that be brilliant if we recognise for how brilliant we can do cyber in this country? So this is the reality. These are real headlines. This is the world we're in today, guys. You know, there's top left there, worried about why are the Russians hanging off the Atlantic cable, why are they hanging just outside our, our space. Um, and we're getting warnings from everybody, whether it's regulators, whether it's the government, whether it's international agencies, whether it's international law enforcement, they're all warnings of the same thing. There's lots of threat actor activity, and a lot of it's geopolitically motivated, and a lot of it is just opportunistic for criminals to get involved when they see that other people are dealing with the warfare side of things and the geopolitical nature of cyber threat actor activity. So this is a real video, just want to play a little bit of it. Have we got audio? I'm so guys, what this is, is from Russian TV, and it's a simulation, and it was a response to uh, Boris, who was saying nasty things about Putin, and they brought out this TV program simulating how a nuclear explosion could take out the whole of U the UK. But they also went on to show how one missile, if it landed off the coast of Ireland in Donegal, would create a 200-meter wave that would take out all of Ireland and turn it into a nuclear desert. That's real. That's propaganda. That's what's going on in this world that we live in from a cyber threat actor activity as well, because this is the reality of what's going on. So we we'll let our friend finish with his uh, dramatization. <laughs> So that's the reality of certain state actors when it comes to warfare, cyber threat activity and so on. 
It's about disinformation. It's about propaganda. It's about hacking. It's about breaking into systems. It's about creating uncertainty, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and so on. So before I, I, I seem like I'm hammering Russia, I have no problem with Russia. I went to live there at age 19. I, I lived in Kazakhstan. I lived in Moscow for a couple of years. I think I have my uh, evidence, which is my little KGB pocket watch. Um, that I brought along just as a, a bit of evidence. Um, and these are actually photographs of me, pre-beard and with hair. So there you go. Um, so I actually don't have any animosity towards Russia, but I do against some of the threat actors that are working there, and we're going to talk some of the, about those. So first of all, to explain a couple of concepts. The fifth domain, warfare is in land, sea, air, space, and now cyberspace. This is real. The Economist magazine coined that term over 10 years ago. And, and this is the reality of what we're dealing with. If you're fighting criminals who are stealing data from your systems, you're fighting cyber warfare. You're also citing about predators who attack children. All of these things lead back, like the elephant. They all lead back to one thing. Nefarious actors all work together. Criminals work with political entities. Political entities work with pedophiles and predators. They all work together within that ecosystem of cyber criminality and that dark underworld. The first ever summit between Putin and Biden they set 22 red lines between each other. And those red lines were a bit like the Geneva Convention where there's rules on warfare. Uh, you know, you're not meant to attack hospitals. You're not meant to attack public places. But there is no Geneva Convention on digital warfare. There's none. There are no rules. So they set 22 rules between each other. You don't touch this and we don't touch this. Because it's not just the Russians do this. A lot of nation states, including the good old US of A, are involved in this kind of activity as well. And, and some of it is for research purposes, some of it's for defensive purposes, and some of it maybe arguably is offensive in, in, in what they're doing as well. We don't benefit from that, unfortunately. And uh, this is what they're targeting. This is what most of these threat actors are after. They're after the industrial control systems, the SCADA based systems, what makes up information society today. You do not need to drop a bomb off the coast of Ireland to control Ireland. You can control electricity, gas, air traffic, trains, darts, all of those things. You can create uncertainty within the banking system. You can, if people can't trust the integrity of the numbers in their bank account, will they trust the government? This is how the Russian threat actors work. This is how they undermine countries and what they've been doing to Ukraine for so long as well. And, that, and that's a case study of how, of how this actually uh, happens. This slide here is pre the invasion of Ukraine. And this is when in the real world, and our two worlds are totally connected, you've got the real physical world and you've got the cyber world. And the, the geopolitics of this are completely connected. What happens in the real physical world impacts the cyber world instantly, instantly within seconds. So if you see rhetoric from Boris or back in the day, or, or, or if you see uh, it coming from America, you'll see an absolute instant effect on the threat actor activity that's happening within the internet and so on. And these were shots across the bow, these were cyber skirmishes where Russia would take down an icon of America like JP Morgan just as a warning to say enough now, that's enough, down with that. And that's the kind of activity that we see all the, all the time that's going on. And of course we get lots of warnings from regulators and so on. But warnings are one thing, but what do you do? Where's the strategy? How do we go about this? How are we going to deal with these kind of threats? So I want to introduce you to this cyber threat actor. His name is Vladimir Putin. And within this industry, I'm all for giving out because we always use acronyms, but I thought it would be appropriate to come up with an acronym for this guy because we need to describe this guy as a threat actor. So he is powerful. He has so much money, so much resources, and so much capacity and access to some of the uh, arguably world's best hackers and, and uh, uh, mercenaries within the cyber warfare uh, field. He's resourceful, he's innovative, he's cold, and he's knowledgeable. The man's a prick, right? <laughs> and I think we can all agree on that, so welcome, Vladimir. Um, he's got his own acronym. Where did he come from? He was created by spin doctors, some of the richest men in the world. We have Borowski, we have Gozinski. And they decided that they already owned all of the, the utilities and all of the assets that Russia, Mother Russia, had. And they said, well, what we want to do is we want to be able to uh, replace Yeltsin. And this was around the time when I went to, to, to live in Russia and so on. They decided, well, once this drunk president goes, we need someone to take uh, charge, so now we control everything within the country. And they literally literally went out and hired some spin doctors. Here's Paul Manafort, and he would be one of the guys who was involved in trying to um, 
coerce and control the narrative within Ukraine and who became president of Ukraine. He subsequently, obviously, ran the campaign for Donald Trump. He subsequently became a, 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 was arrested as well uh, on, on that front. So birds of a feather flocked together. Some of these nefarious actors are put together. But when they carried out their research, and that research was done by PR companies, these, these guys, uh, uh, these oligarchs hired the best research companies in the world, and they put ads in newspapers and surveys and everything else, and they said, who do you want to be president after Yeltsin? And they came back. Absolutely overwhelming results was they wanted this guy, Max Otto van Stierlitz. Anybody ever hear of him? Who is he? He's actually a fictitious character. He's like a Russian James Bond out of a TV program. And they said, that's what we want. We want someone strong. We want someone like a KGB agent. We want somebody that we, you know, is going to have that military uh, strong uh, impression that we give out to the rest of the world. So they found him, Vladimir Putin. He was in the Stasi, he was in the KGB, he was, he was uh, working over in Germany at the time, and they decided they would groom him into be becoming president. They didn't realize at some stage he would turn on them and arrest them and so on as, as, the, as the story goes on. So in 1999, this mid-level civil servant in an ill-fitting suit that nobody had ever seen before, at the turn of the millennium, came out to the people of Russia and they were going, who is this guy? and he was taking over, and that was the handover of power between Yeltsin and himself. Now, because he was in the KGB, and most people would know who the KGB are, the KGB got rebranded to the FSB. The FSB runs a cyber intelligence operation signals and intelligence unit known as the GRU, and they run out of this tower in Moscow. I know I'm speaking quite quickly, a lot of information to gain in a very short window of time. Um, and they also run agencies such as the IRA, different from the ones that we would be aware of. But the IRA were simply this agency they set up uh, where they had 800 bloggers trained on things like neurolinguistic program, how to control the narrative, how to control disinformation in a country and convince people that the earth is flat, basically. So this is an army of online trolls and bloggers using the most sophisticated methods and techniques in order to control the narrative within different countries around the world. And they all answer to the GRU, and the GRU all answers to the FSB, and the FSB all answers to the prick. So all of these aliases, all of these pieces of the elephant lead back. So when you see some of these bigger end attacks and they talk about, oh, this is one called Guccifer, this is one called APT28 Voodoo Bear, whatever, they are all the GRU. They're all one cyber threat actor, which is Russia, and it's controlled by this guy here. As we move on, some of these are high-end operations that you'd be more aware of, such as the DNC attack in the United States, uh, such as the World Anti-Doping Agency, and Petya, and so on, and not Petya as well. Um, and one closer to home, called the HSE. Okay, and now evidence has appeared that they were directly involved in that attack. So what has that cost Ireland so far? Well, it's going to cost approximately 657 million more. It's cost over 100 million. But where do we get these numbers from? Where do we get this from? The reality is, the day, if you want to see about this relationship, there's a great um, article in Wired magazine where a Ukrainian hacker actually hacked the Conti ransomware group and they got all the information out, which proves the LinkedIn. But if you, if you just want to go beyond that and to see how obvious this is, on Conti Ransomware's group's website, now this, is a, this is a company, this is a corporation, Conti Ransomware, and they make 180 million with 62 staff. That's 3 million per staff member. They're nice numbers uh, for a tech company. And they w were able to uh, get that evidence to show that there was that direct linkage. But on the day of the Ukrainian invasion, on that piece of their website, they put up a notice saying, Vladimir, you have our full support with everything you need for the Ukrainian war. Full support. There's a direct relationship. It's not just anecdotal, and there's lots of more evidence. And anybody who is in this game and knows what's going on knows about these kind of relationships. So that was one that was close to home. So effectively what we're looking at here is, is it warfare? Is it criminality? Is it terrorism? What, what is it that we're all trying to deal with? And everybody in this room who works in the cybersecurity industry is playing the part in defending against effectively what we would refer to as cyber evil. Because all of these people work together in that same ecosystem. Whether they're working with you know, predators, whether they're working against criminals, whatever it has to be, human traffickers, all of those. So, change gear a little bit, guys, to, to sum this up. How are we going to deal with this? Well, we need a strategy. And thankfully, the EU have actually a really, really good strategy on this. And it's called the EU Cyber Strategy. It was put together on the 16th of December 2020. And it's all about a digital connected Europe based on trust. 
trust. Now, trust is a weird word because we all have a different view of trust. And what we're all trying to create in this world, whether it's digital business and so on, is that trust. When you trust something, you become vulnerable to it. The ultimate trust is love. So trust is something different even between twins and so on, how they trust people, how they trust things within their life. So it's this weird human emotion that we're trying to create with digital trust online as we put more of our lives uh, onto that digital world. It comes in three streams, and th there's the three streams there, and you can go through this within the document and so on. And those three streams come together with amazing ingredients, and this is some of the headline ingredients in the magic cake that is the EU cyber strategy. And the things like artificial intelligence socks, Cyber Shield. Um, we have uh, digital innovation uh, hubs aimed at the likes of uh, uh, small to medium enterprises. We have DORA, Digital Operations Resilience Act. We have CEO, the Critical Entities Resilience Act. These people, these pieces of legislation, artifacts, which will help harmonize cyber risk across supply chains, across sectors like the financial sector. This is good stuff, and you should know all about it if you work in the world of cybersecurity. If this is news to you, you're not doing your job very well because you should all know about the EU cyber strategy and how it affects businesses in Ireland. When is DORA coming in? What are the fines associated with DORA? What, what are the reporting requirements? This is our jobs. We need to protect businesses and be able to make sure that they're operating legally and they're protecting and they're getting that benefit of harmonization within the EU as, as we all operate. And it, it is funded with an unprecedented amount of lula, of cash, 4.5 billion, and there's a huge amount of it earmarked for SMEs. So look, guys, as I conclude, uh, I'm going to try and paraphrase the words of John F. Kennedy where he said, well, all this means little to Ireland in an age where history moves with the tramp of earthquake feet. And he used these words when he was summing up in 1963 and he addressed the Doyle in Ireland. And he was talking about the world being on the brink of nuclear war. And he went on to say that it means little to Ireland uh, uh, and, and how can Ireland play much of a role on a world stage when the needs of the emerging nations are so great and so staggering that even the richest nations often groan with the burden of assistance. So people will say, well, how can Ireland play much of a role on a world stage? Well, Ireland's not rich and powerful, but its impact on the world has been both rich and powerful. George Bernard Shaw, speaking as an Irishman, summed up an approach to life. He said, others see things and say why, but I dream of things that never were and ask why not. And it's that attitude of the Irish, that unique combination, it's a quality, that unique combination of hope, imagination and confidence that's required more than ever today. We need men and women that can dream of things that never were and ask why not. The problems of this world are not going to be solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited by obvious realities. We need men and women that can dream of things they never wear and ask why not. Cyber innovation is what we need. Gurmil Magath. Thank you.